And it is rocking the race for president this morning. Brand new emails that have now been uncovered, phone records that match up with them and expose deep ties between the Clinton Foundation and Hillary Clinton's State Department. Good morning, everybody. Lots to go through here this morning. I'm Martha McCallum. And good morning, Martha. Good morning, Eric. And good morning, everyone. I'm Eric Sean in Phil Bullhammer this morning. You know, she said she turned everything over to the feds. But guess what? Now the FBI finding nearly 15,000 previously unreleased emails and a federal judge is demanding that they be released immediately. Buried in those exchanges, top aide Huma Abedin giving special access to the Crown Prince of Bahrain, who was a major, I mean major, like $30 million donor to the Clinton Foundation. And on top of that, another whackdog group has now found hundreds of phone messages from a foundation executive to Cheryl Mills, who is Hillary Chief's, Hillary's chief of staff during her time at the State Department. And Donald Trump seizing on this new information, calling for a special prosecutor to be named right now. The amounts involved... The favors done and the significant number of times it was done require an expedited investigation by a special prosecutor immediately, immediately, immediately. After the FBI or Department of Justice whitewashed Hillary Clinton's email crimes, they certainly cannot be trusted to quickly or impartially investigate Hillary Clinton's new crimes, which happen all the time. So we've got Team Fox coverage for you. Mike Emanuel has reaction from the Clinton campaign. John Roberts is with the Trump camp. And Byron York standing by for analysis this morning. So let's get started with you, Mike, uh, laying out what we have learned here. What's in these new emails? Well, Martha, nearly 15,000 emails collected by the FBI, which could be released just weeks before the election. There are also a group of emails showing the interaction between longtime Clinton aide Huma Abedin and longtime Clinton uh, Foundation executive Doug Band, uh, released by the advocate group Judicial Watch, showing some of the interaction between the two. One from June 2009, showing to, uh, basically Band trying to get a meeting for the Crown Prince of Bahrain with Secretary Clinton, uh, a prince who had committed $32 million to the Clinton Global Initiative. There were also nearly 150 messages left for State Department Chief of Staff Cheryl Mills by the Clinton Foundation's Chief Operating Officer over a two-year period. That's according to call logs released by the State Department in response to a Citizens United lawsuit. There was this reaction from a State Department spokesman. Secretary Clinton's ethics agreement at the time did not preclude other State Department officials from engaging with or having contact with the Clinton Foundation. In Hollywood last night, Clinton had a lighter moment with late night host Jimmy, Kill Jimmy Kimmel. Are you enjoying being a grandparent? It is the best, Jimmy. Do you wish you had more time that this campaign didn't coincide with the kids being so little? Well, right I now? think I'd be distraught if we didn't have FaceTime. Oh, I really do you do, do that a lot? All the time. Uh, you know, have you considered using FaceTime instead of email? <laughs> um, actually, actually, I think that's really that's good not advice. A bad idea. On a more serious note, Clinton campaign spokesman Brian Fallon said last night, quote, Hillary Clinton has consistently taken responsibility for her decision to use a single email account. And she has said for over a year now it was a mistake and she regrets it. But this email issue continues to linger with more potentially coming out ahead of Election Day. Martha. So, Mike, how's the Clinton campaign responding at this point? Well, they are responding to attacks on the Clinton Foundation by essentially saying that they will change procedures if Hillary Clinton is elected president. They are also punching back. There, there's Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta attacking Donald Trump, saying essentially that Trump needs to come clean about some of his business practices, about his complex network of for-profit businesses that are hundreds of millions of dollars in debt to the big banks. And Clinton running mate Tim Kaine defended the foundation's work. Today you raised some questions about the Clinton Foundation. The Clinton Foundation is a nonprofit organization that is a world-class charity. It's provided life-saving AIDS drugs to 11 and a half million people. And all the donors to the foundation have been disclosed. And the foundation has said, I'll go further. We'll restructure itself completely if Hillary Clinton is elected president. That's a pledge. It is clear the Clinton campaign and its allies took attacks on the foundation very seriously 
with their swift response. Martha. All right, Mike, thank you. Well, meanwhile, on the Republican side, as Mr. Trump calls for that special prosecutor to investigate Mrs. Clinton, there are now new questions this morning on whether or not he is softening his stance on immigration, his campaign denying that. But they've canceled what was supposed to be a big speech on that issue on Thursday in Colorado. John Roberts reporting live outside of Trump Tower here in New York City on the Trump campaign. John, let's first start with the Clinton situation and those emails and Mr. Trump's call for a special prosecutor. Eric, good morning to you. You know, there's an, an age-old tactic in politics, and that is when your candidate's uh, or your, when your opponent's campaign is running off a cliff, don't do anything to interfere with that. And that's the philosophy that Donald Trump is employing this week. He was going to be talking all about immigration with a big speech in Denver planned for Thursday. They've decided that because of this controversy involving the new 15,000 emails that had just been discovered, as well as all of this uh, news about the Clinton Foundation and whether or not people were buying access to the State Department, they've just decided we're going to sit back and let that drive the news cycle. But, of course, they're also going to throw a little bit of wood on the fire. Last night in Akron, Ohio, Donald Trump insisting that a special prosecutor has to look into this because the Obama administration, Department of Justice, can't be trusted to conduct a fair and impartial investigation. Here's what Trump said last night. The Clintons made the State Department into the same kind of pay-for-play operation as the Arkansas government. The Justice Department is required to appoint an independent special prosecutor because it has proven itself to be really, sadly, a political arm of the White House. That is a point that the Trump campaign is going to continue to drive home. They released emails about it this morning. He's likely to talk at length with Sean Hannity about it in the town hall. He's likely to talk about it tonight in Austin at that big rally, as well as one tomorrow in Tampa and then tomorrow night in Jackson. Plenty of opportunity this week, Eric, for Donald Trump to drive that point home. And uh, absolutely. And John will be uh, dealing with this and going through it and reporting on it through the next two hours. John Roberts reporting from Trump Tower. Thank you. Martha? So let's dive a little bit deeper into this whole email issue. In one exchange, longtime Bill Clinton aide Doug Band writes to Huma Abedin, the CP or Crown Prince of Bahrain is in town and would like to see then Secretary of State Clinton calling him a, quote, good friend of ours. She replies, saying that the Crown Prince has tried to meet with her through, quote, normal channels and that Clinton didn't want to commit. But just two days later, the crown prince suddenly got his meeting with Secretary Clinton. And that is just one of the examples that has cropped up here. So what's the meaning of it and how serious is it? Joining us, Byron York, chief political correspondent for The Washington Examiner and a Fox News contributor. Um, Byron, good morning to you. Uh, good morning, clearly, Martha. Hillary Clinton didn't seem to think that this was a serious thing at all. She really laughed the whole thing off with Jimmy Kimmel last night. You know, she's going to have to do more than that because this actually does seem to illustrate what Donald Trump was talking about when he said pay for play. You have this foreign official, comes to the U.S., wants to meet with the Secretary of State, can't get a meeting through regular channels, goes to the Clinton Foundation, where Bahrain has given a lot of money to the Clinton Global Initiative especially, and the Clinton Foundation goes back to Hillary Clinton's office and said, hey, this guy's a good friend of ours, you know, you might want to let him in, and he gets his meeting. So it, it really does appear to be kind of a classic pay-for-play situation. You know, if at the very least, just the disclosure that these aides are spending all of this time on this Clinton Foundation stuff, right, going back and forth, answering these emails, setting up meetings. I mean, this is when Syria is imploding. ISIS is on the rise. This is the State Department. It seems that the, you know, and no doubt they were dealing with important business as well. But there's a lot of time and effort going into this stuff, Byron. Absolutely. And you have to remember there's kind of a revolving door uh, as well. Cheryl Mills, who was mentioned earlier, who was Hillary Clinton's chief of staff at the State Department, came to the State Department from the Clinton Foundation, where she had been on the board of directors. And after Hillary Clinton left the foundation, excuse me, left the State Department, Cheryl Mills went back to the foundation. So these, these are people who are longtime employees of the Clintons. And if Mrs. Clinton is in government, they go into government. If Mrs. Clinton is out of government, they're with the foundation. And isn't Bill Clinton's sort of um, a session that if indeed she's elected, he would step aside, that he wouldn't be on the board anymore? Doesn't that sort of it's an admission that there is some inherent conflict of interest or at least a perception of one. 
It's a huge open door for Republicans, not just for Donald Trump, but for the Republicans on Capitol Hill who've been calling for more investigation, not just of the foundation, but also an investigation of the FBI's investigation yeah. Yeah. of the emails, because this is basically not just the Clinton Foundation, but now Bill Clinton himself. So if Hillary Clinton is elected, they'll take off role in the Clinton Foundation. Just quickly, um, Byron, one last thing for you. Why didn't the FBI investigate her under oath? And why, why were they only scratching down notes and not recording everything for public record? Well, I'm told, I mean, this is standard procedure. There's a report called an FBI 302 form where if you do an interview with someone, uh, agents take detailed notes. But this is by hand, sometimes with a computer, but uh, they take detailed notes. They don't make a transcript. They don't take uh, make a recording. I'm told that sometimes changes. That is sometimes used these days, but it was not used uh, in this. And, and to, to add to that, uh, now that Republicans on Capitol Hill have gotten to see some of these FBI documents from the investigation. They're saying they're, the FBI has heavily redacted them. They've blacked out large parts of them, and Republicans don't know why these parts were blacked out. So you're going to see a fight over that as well. Uh, it's a very legitimate question. I mean, you would think in such a high-profile case there would be a transcript of this conversation, um, of her answers to all of the questions, which apparently just does not exist, which I think a also lot of remember, find Martha, surprising. Yeah, Byron. They, they did that interview three and a half hours with Hillary Clinton on a Saturday afternoon, right. and within 48 hours, Hours, they came out and exonerated her. Yeah. So you have to wonder, were they looking for so-called process crimes, whether she was telling the truth about every single aspect of this, or were they in a kind of a rush to make a decision? Looking to put it behind them, perhaps. Um, Byron, thank you very much. Good to thank see you Thank you, this Martha. Morning. Well, it's becoming a disturbing new trend by the radical Islamic terrorists of ISIS. And now there's that new shocking video showing Iraqi police removing a suicide belt from a 15-year-old kid, this after that bombing by a 12- to 14-year-old in Turkey. We'll have the details of ISIS using children to blow themselves up and kill others. And with waves of refugees streaming into Europe from the Middle East, the head of the European Union is now calling for an end to national borders around the countries of Europe. How would that work? And people in Louisiana in the flood zone today getting ready to, for a visit from President Obama. You know, some people criticized him for not interrupting his vacation in Martha's Vineyard when he went golfing. To do this, the governor had asked him to wait a couple of weeks, but he will be there today. And we'll bring you all the details coming up on America's Newsroom. It's a neighbor helping neighbor. We're not relying on anybody else. We're not waiting for $400 million that might have gone to Iran to come to us. We're here taking care of ourselves. Wow. Uh, it's a tribute to you and your community. to Louisiana later this morning after getting backlash for spending the weekend playing golf instead of surveying the damage from that deadly flooding. Sean Hannity spoke with victims in Baton Rouge, one woman telling him that she's not surprised by the president's lack of action. I hate to say this. No, say it. Because I love America. I don't want to live anywhere else. And I know our crew does the best that they can do. Right. But I don't think Washington gives a hoot about anybody but their pockets. Did you see the president playing golf during all this? No, I didn't, because I, I don't have a TV. Louisiana Congressman John Fleming joins us now. Congressman, good morning to you and welcome. Good morning, Mark. Um, yes. So the president has there today. Is it too late? Well, Martha, it's never too late, but my goodness, look how long it's, it's been over a week since the floods began. And look, I got to tell you, I was in Baton Rouge when the water was rising. Uh, I visited churches. I, I visited low-rent housing in Washington and Eunice, Louisiana. I went to Denham Springs. I was there when Donald Trump and Mike Pence were there. Uh, that's ground zero, a thousand-year flood. And the devastation is unbelievable, but neighbors are helping neighbors in Louisiana. In terms of a presidential response, you know, I, I know that you say you don't need to come right to the scene right away, mm -hmm. but what would you have preferred in terms of a response from the president? What would have been the most helpful? Well, I, I've got to tell you, uh, Mayor Landry in, in Denham Springs, again, ground zero, told me that after six days they had seen no federal fi officials, no one had brought water to them or food except for faith-based organizations. Uh, the president should have been there hearing their story. 
And, uh, you know, there's something about heart here. There's something about emotion, <clears throat> psychological support. These people are crying on people's shoulders. They cried on my shoulders. <clears throat> they were talking about uh, memories that were destroyed in their homes. And the president out playing golf, it really makes uh, people in Louisiana angry and sad that the president seems to have turned his back on the people of Louisiana in their time of greatest need. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the right words, even from a distance, uh, go a long way because these people Absolutely. feel like the country forgot about them and that they weren't, you know, everybody was on vacation and not paying attention uh, when this was happening to them. So, you know, in terms of, of the visit that you had from Donald Trump and Mike Pence, uh, what was your perception of that? Because some people felt it was, you know, sort of election politics. Did you, what was your sense oh. of, of what they were like on the ground? N not at all. They were cheered. They were very much appreciated. And the people of Louisiana appreciate leadership. And I really have to believe the president actually would need most for the people of Louisiana. So really heart and emotion is a lot. Psychological support. If the president is not going to show up, then of course there's a lot of concern over the fact that FEMA and the National Guard or others who may not be on the ground the way they should, we have to ask the question, well, then, if the president's not here, no wonder there's a delay in other types of services. It's kind of shocking, given the criticism that President Absolutely. Bush got from President Obama, uh, Senator Obama at the time, that he wouldn't be especially sensitive to this situation and want to make sure that he was you know, doing all that he could and more. Well, the president himself uh, criticized President Bush while he was a senator, President, uh, Senator Obama at the time, criticized President Bush, and all the president did was try to avoid creating any problems. He didn't want to create a disturbance, but he regrets not having shown up. President Obama should have learned from that experience. He should be here, <clears throat> should have been here, frankly, a week ago. Congressman, thank you. Uh, no doubt you, when Martha. he gets there, he will see that devastation firsthand, and it's striking. Everybody who's reporting to us from there just says how unbelievably devastating it is. So we uh, send our good it thoughts is. to you all, um, and we hope that you continue to get the help that you need. Thank you very much, thank Congressman. You so much. Good to see you this yes. morning. Martha, a would-be suicide bomber dispatched by ISIS stopped by police. And that suspect reportedly just 15 years old. Coming up, we'll tell you about the disturbing new trend from the terrorist group deploying children as terrorist killers. And what Muslim community here at home trying to send a message to ISIS by putting up this billboard? Look at what it says. of Syrian rebels backed by Turkey are preparing to launch an attack on an ISIS stronghold along the Turkey-Syria border. The assault is expected to take place over the next few days. It comes after multiple attacks by the Islamic State inside Turkey, and they are now fighting back, including a bombing at a, we at a wedding this past weekend. And that attack at Turkey's main airport in Istanbul that happened back in June. And as if, as if the depths of depravity, the radical Islamic terrorism killing innocents is not shocking enough, there's a new trend we've been telling you about, using children as suicide bombers. There's more disturbing video coming out of Iraq that shows police stripping a bomb from a would-be suicide attacker. And that young boy with that suicide bomb belt is believed to be as young as 15 years old. He was stopped in the city of Kirkuk by police, and his arrest comes just one day after another child was believed to be the bomber who killed all those people in the wedding party in Turkey over the weekend. John Huddy is live in a Middle East bureau with the very latest. So, John, first let's start with that child uh, in Iraq, the latest uh, potential suicide bomber. What do we know about that young boy? Well, Eric, uh, Iraqi police are saying that the boy is claiming that he was kidnapped by ISIS militants and then forced to try to carry out this attempted bombing. Uh, disturbing video, as you mentioned, Eric, and also compelling video as we look at it again, showing those Iraqi police officers disarming uh, clearly, um, and obviously we blur his face, but a very uh, upset 15-year-old boy, uh, believed to be anyway, who had a suicide belt strapped around his waist loaded with explosives that could have caused horrific damage like we saw as mentioned 
in Turkey. 54 people were killed in a suicide bombing at a wedding party, possibly by a child attacker, though Turkish officials have not confirmed that and really have backed away from claims it was a boy, maybe even as young as old. For more information, there is serious concern at this point uh, that ISIS is using younger recruits, such as children, to carry out these type of attacks as it continues to lose ground in Iraq and parts of Syria. Uh, this is just so unspeakable and obscene. I mean, really, using young children like this. And it is a growing yeah, trend. absolutely. It's a growing trend. Well, it, 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 it yeah, it, well, that's the concern is that this can continue, that ISIS is using new tactics and, and recruiting and using groups of children to do this. It's not the first time either, as we've seen in the past, uh, ISIS has used children to carry out executions, beheadings, shootings. We've seen the video of that before, Eric. ISIS isn't alone. Al-Qaeda has done the same thing as we've seen in the past. Uh, the Taliban has done that in Afghanistan, Boko Haram in Africa, and also other radical Islamic groups such as Hamas. Hamas recruits uh, children and younger fighters to carry out, or at least to fight, uh, against Israel. I saw that, Eric, when I was in Gaza recently, billboards showing children, in my estimation, as young as 10 or 11 years old, and my translator agreed with this, you know, dressed in military fatigues and holding an AK-47. AK so obviously, uh, serious concern about ISIS increasing the use of these young recruits. Yeah, uh, just so, just so sad. Uh, John, thank you so much for your insight. So it was more than a year ago when Hillary Clinton said that she had deleted her personal email because there was nothing worth reading in them. Remember this? I chose not to keep my private personal emails. Emails about planning Chelsea's wedding or my mother's funeral arrangements, condolence notes to friends, as well as yoga routines, family vacations. Well, we know from the FBI uh, testimony that there were indeed work-related emails among those. And what a difference a year makes now. We learned that thousands of new emails talk about quite a bit more than yoga. In fact, I don't think they've found any yoga emails in there as far as I know. Um, so people want answers. They want to know about the FBI investigation and how it operated. All of this is gaining steam. Do you think that's just a coincidence? Make no mistake, when you donate millions and millions of dollars, what are you asking for? And as we have been reporting this morning, stunning new evidence pointing towards a potential pay-for-play operation between Hillary Clinton's State Department and the Clinton Foundation. You know, thousands of newly uncovered emails and phone messages have revealed prominent foundation donors received special access to then-Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, even though Mrs. Clinton and the Clinton campaign insist there was no wrongdoing. Not true, says Judicial Watch, the conservative advocacy group that brought that Freedom of Information Act lawsuit to get the emails. It says the new emails are proof of shocking conflicts of interest and bad faith. Mrs. Clinton swore under penalty of perjury that as best as she knew, all these records, all government records have been turned over. Uh, but this court hearing today demonstrated that wasn't the case. Well, the new batch may include thousands of work-related emails, but you know Mrs. Clinton claimed repeatedly that she had already turned over all of her work-related emails to the State Department. We went through a thorough process to identify all of my work-related emails and deliver them to the State Department. I turned over everything I was obligated to turn over, and then I moved on. I turned over everything that I could imagine. When I see you're, you are interviewed, you make a point of saying, I turned over everything. All my work-related emails. How do you know that? I know that because there was a, an exhaustive search done uh, under the uh, supervision of my attorneys. Well, that apparently is not the case. Rich Lowry, editor of National Review and Fox's contributor. Brad Woodhouse, president of Correct the Record and former communications director for the DNC and member of Hillary Pack. Welcome to you both. Hi, Eric. Uh, Washington Post this morning, front page. Donors given access to Clinton. I mean, Rich, they told us this isn't the case. Campaign manager Abby Mook says there's a complete separation, full transparency, uh, nothing to hear 
to see here, folks. What does this mean? This is a gross distortion, Eric, of how our government is supposed to work. People gave money to the Clinton Foundation. In exchange, they got access to high government officials who are supposed to be focused on doing the public's work, not doing the work of some other private interest. So this is horrifying, and a lot of the media is trying to set up this kind of this new distinction. Oh, they're just paying for access. We have no evidence they actually bought policy or state action. But buying access is bad enough. It's disgusting, and it's why people think our government is, is, is broken and can't be trusted. Brad, how do you explain well, this? Look, well, look, Rich, first of all, you, you, you have no proof that anyone bought access. I mean, the fact is there are, there are plenty of people who would give to a foundation. They may give to the Clinton Foundation. They may give to the Gates Foundation. They may give to any foundation in America, and they might still have business before the State Department. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean ergo uh, that they have Have you uh, they seen have the emails, the Brad? Access. Have you seen the emails that, that, where Doug Band is emailing Huma Abedin saying, this guy is very important to us, he needs a meeting, and she's responsive to that? Brad, that you can't deny that it. It is in the, black and white in these Rich, emails that, that Hillary mean, Clinton tried Rich, to that hide from mean, the public for exactly this reason. That doesn't mean that through other. That doesn't mean through other means or other channels, those people wouldn't have gotten. They wouldn't have got the same meeting. I mean, you act like Rich. You've never sent an email to anyone asking them, uh, asking but them Brad, for a meeting. But for Brad, a let me interrupt, let me interrupt you both. You let know, me interrupt I mean, you. Wait a minute, Rich. Sure. Brad, this is not supposed to happen. They were not supposed to go around the loop over to the Clinton Foundation. Let me read you two emails specifically that deal with a, a, a big donor to the uh, Global Initiative. This guy's name is Casey Wasserman. He's a sports uh, marketing agent. Uh, Mrs. Clinton's having a fundraiser. Before I read this, I'm going to tell you about the guy in Beverly Hills. His foundation apparently gave 5 to $10 million to the Clinton Foundation, hired Bill Clinton for like $3 million in a consulting fee, and here's the, the email. They're trying to get... Uh, apparently a visa for a British soccer player, which they can't get. So what, 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 is, what do they do? They go right to uh, Huma. Uh, and here's the email from her. I doubt we can do anything, but maybe we can help with an interview. I'll ask. I got this now. Makes me nervous to get involved, but I'll ask. Band replies, then don't. Mrs. Uh, Aberdeen, uh, Huma, is so, admitting right there she's, she's nervous. She knows something so is wrong. She, she basically she said, realizes she basically that said this, no. is, this is not good. She, she, no, she said, I'll in not so many words, In not so many words, she declined. In not so many words, she declined the request. I mean, that's, that's a courtesy... Uh, a courteous way of declining <laughs> a, a request. I mean, you know, Rich, you know what you want to do. I got to give, I gotta give Brad. I got to give Brad credit. He is earning his pay this morning. This is a real manful <laughs> effort. But there's a reason Casey Wasserman. He could have just given to the Red Cross. He didn't have to give to the Clinton Foundation. And why all these political donors? Well, why it, all these foreign interests? Hold on, Brad. The, the reason why they gave the Clinton Foundation is they knew Doug Ban worked for a former president, was tied in perhaps to a future president and to the current Secretary of State, and they could get government favors for it. Brad, that is just plain as day. There's no way that, to deny it. Don't even that try. Is not plain as day. That is not plain as day. You don't have a shred of evidence to suggest in the emails. Uh, that anything untoward occurred. I mean, emails about meetings are what, Rich? They're emails about meetings. But, so Brad, what? Brad, that's, Brad, that's, that's I, access. That's what the critics right, are claiming. They Quickly, for access. 30 seconds left. Brad, what's going to happen? Is she going to get indicted? What's going to happen? Of course he's not going to get indicted. She already hadn't gotten indicted. We already had an FBI director that Republicans love and have praised through the years uh, who said that no reasonable prosecutor would bring any case related, uh, related to these emails. They have a dumpster fire of a candidate on their side, so they want to continue to peck at this issue uh, to, try to, to try to save down-ballot candidates Eric, Eric, from, from Donald Trump. In sheer political terms, Eric, I think the Clinton email, just the, the fact that she used the private email, is baked into the cake. People have decided about that. But what they haven't decided about, what they haven't really heard for, is this kind of pay, to pay for play. And it's a major vulnerability of hers and a major test for Donald Trump. He needs to make sure this week is about nothing else. Mm, right. Nothing else except for these Clinton emails. Well, she told us uh, there's the, it's all about the yoga and the wedding and all, all the stuff was turned over and that's not the case. Brad and Rich, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Well, Martha. get them out. Get them out. So Hillary Clinton, as you guys have been talking about, trying to laugh off concerns about her email investigation and her family's foundation. When she appeared with Jimmy Kimmel last night, she told the late night host that her political opponents have a new point of attack, which is her health. Are you in good health? Well, this has become one of their themes. Here, you take my, take my pulse while I'm talking to you. Okay. Um, so, uh, make sure I'm alive. 
Oh my God, there's nothing there's, there. I don't know why they are saying this. I think, on the one hand, it's part of the wacky strategy. Uh -huh. uh, just say all these crazy things and maybe you can get some people to believe you. Um, on the other hand, it just absolutely makes no sense. And I, I don't go around questioning Donald Trump's health. I mean, as far as I can tell, he's as healthy as a horse. So just to be sure that she was okay, uh, Kimmel had her open a jar of pickles, which she did successfully, which is always the clear test mm. for overall health, right? She didn't even need, did she use one of those things that you can go <laughs> no, buy at the store? No, she did it with you her know. bare hands. All right. I, I need that, that rubber thing you know, that you, <laughs> to do that. Well, meanwhile, Europe, if you heard about this, uh, we know it faces a, a range of challenges from the flood of refugees, terrorism, and uh, sluggish economy. But get this, one top European official has been calling the national borders, quote, the worst invention ever. What does he mean? We'll tell you coming up. Plus a life and death situation that was caught on video, a fire tears through a home, and the hero police officers who saved three lives. I called the cops right away, so if I didn't call the cops right away, then we'd probably all be dead. You could see that, you know, the fear on their faces as they're coming down. They said, drop the baby, drop the baby, and they just dropped the baby and they caught the baby during a massive fire that tore through a house in New Jersey. It happened in the town of Sayreville where four people, including two young girls and an infant boy, were trapped inside that house. Look at that smoke. Well, the flames had already when spread to the front run. door when police arrived. I tried to get up the stairway, but it was fully engulfed. Uh, there was no way getting up there. Looked at the people who were getting the ladder, then looked up in the air, and she was already jumping. So as she was on her way down, I caught her. Wow. Well, luckily, they all did manage to make it to a bathroom window, and they jumped out of that window to safety. Thankfully, no one was seriously injured. The cause of that fire still under investigation. So the head of the European Union saying that national borders are, quote, the worst invention ever. Jean-Claude Juncker says that he wants to open all of the borders between the countries in Europe, this despite a flood of refugees from the Middle East and the recent terror attacks in Germany, France and Belgium. Joining me now with his thoughts on this, John Bolton, former U.S. ambassador to the U.N. and a Fox News contributor. Good to have you here this morning, sir. Good morning. So what do you think about those comments? <laughs> Well, cue up the John Lennon music. Look, uh, what you're hearing here is the essence of the European Union theology, that war in Europe was caused by nation states. Uh, the way you eliminate war in Europe is eliminate nation states. And it's one reason, I think the most profound reason, why the British just voted to leave. They actually like their country and would prefer to keep it rather than uh, see it in a borderless Europe like Juncker's imagining. But the practical consequences really do, though, go to day-to-day -day security for average Europeans with this flood of refugees uh, covering so many terrorists, with the terrorist attacks we've seen. A borderless Europe uh, looks a lot less attractive today than it did uh, back in the dreams of the founders of the EU. Yeah, I mean, it feels like the sentiment in Europe is going in the actual opposite direction of what he's talking about. Um, is that your sense, or is that just what we, you know, sort of what we read about how people are feeling in Europe? No, I, th I think that is an increasing mood in the public as a whole. It's certainly been spurred by the refugee flows, but, but it's been building for a long time, and it goes to the basic flaws in the European Union project. This is a top-down uh, uh, initiative. driven by people who have concluded uh, on an ideological basis that a uh, Europe without nation states making a super store of the world currency is failing. It's failing because people are rarely consulted about what they think of this project and when they do in referenda and country after country they tend to vote against it. So when you add on the terrorist problem, the terrorist uh, threat caused by the refugees, flows, uh, it's no wonder it's coming to a boiling point. You're also, of course, sensing these themes in the election process here at home as well. When Hillary crimes get to stay, collecting Social Security benefits, skipping the line. Our border open, it's more of the same, but worse. Similar uh,
team from what you're seeing debated in Europe, right? Well, I think there are two things going on. One, inside Europe, which has never been a nation from people from outside of Europe entirely. The, the Middle East has wanted to move to Europe for a thousand years or so. They're having uh, pretty spectacular luck these past few years. So in terms of Juncker, you know, What's his future, and is there traction to his statement, or you know, is he isolated within the the EU and and the other sort of the years as they're called that has helped fuel the anti-EU sentiment within uh, all the member states to a lesser or greater extent, uh, and it really, it to me, it highlights the virtues of just. Good But old-fashioned representative government, before you put somebody in a position to say something like that, you ought to see if he can get elected by real people outside of his native country, Luxembourg. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to watch the new on. You know, when you look at these elections, Sarkozy has now announced that he's going to run again in France. What kind of impact do you see on the elections in Europe from this? Well, I think it's going to be very significant. You know, Sarkozy, uh, who, who was thought to be finished in politics, is now coming back, uh, waging, as he did his campaign, to send a blunt message to ISIS. They're putting up this billboard. Why they say they are taking a stand. The thing is, is that our neighbors' view of Muslims has gone down because the message of ISIS has gone up. This one Muslim group in Arizona is making sure that residents know exactly how they feel about ISIS. And they put up this billboard. Take a look at that. From hashtag actual Muslims, it says on the bottom, and it quotes the Quran, life is sacred in the upper right-hand corner. One of the people behind this ad says that the Muslim community wants to set the record straight. And this campaign you may see elsewhere because they want it to go national. It started with a billboard in Chicago, and they hope that they're going to get more traction with these billboards around the country. Interesting way uh, to... Go after ISIS. You may see them popping up across the country. Well, there's been a spate of drug overdoses in Los Angeles, and that has health officials blaming a new synthetic form of marijuana. Chief Correspondent Jonathan Hunt is in L.A. with the latest on this. Hi, Jonathan. Hey, Eric, the first calls came in around 10.30 in the morning, and within a very short time, emergency responders were dealing with 18 people yesterday, apparently sickened by synthetic marijuana, known on the streets as K2 or Spice. Now, Skid Row, where this happened, is the center of the homeless population in downtown L.A., and Spice is popular there because it's very cheap. But as this incident and a similar one last Friday show, it's it's also very dangerous. Here's the chief medical director of LA's fire department. Listen here. So nobody really knows uh, what ingredients are in there. Every batch is different in terms of potency and what active ingredients are there. So patients smoke these things really at their own peril. Now, Spice or K2 use exploded last year continues to be an issue of great concern on the streets of many American cities. The American Association of Poison Control Centers reports so far this year there have been around 1,700 exposure cases, meaning people getting sickened by this stuff. The worst states, Florida, with 136 cases, Texas with 178, and New York with 209. Now, the draw for users is that Spice 
spice is cheap, about a dollar a joint. It can't be seen on most drug tests, and it's also widely available. Here's one user. Listen. Just smoke some spice right now. I feel perfectly fine. If it's so bad, why it costs so less? You know, they only want a dollar for it. That's all they want, man. Most of the synthetic marijuana is legal, uh, it's easily obtainable, but it is, according to one doctor, a public health crisis across this country. Eric? That sounds like it. Jonathan, thank you. Fox News alert here. We are hearing about a possible stabbing attack in Virginia. The FBI investigation as a possible terrorist attack into this case now. We're going to give you the details when we come back right after this. Fox News alert. We are just learning that the FBI is investigating whether a stabbing attack in Virginia was actually a terror incident that could have been inspired by ISIS. Police say that the suspect shouted Allah Akbar during that attack and they want to know uh, whether or not he was inspired by Islamic extremism, and that has now opened up a whole new chapter in that investigation. Welcome, everybody. Brand new hour now of America's Newsroom. Good morning. Everyone on, I'm in for Bill Hammer. Well, according to the latest reports, this is the suspect. He is identified as 20-year-old Wasil Farouki. He recently, they say, traveled to Turkey, and he may have been trying to sneak into Syria and join ISIS. Here's the police dispatch chatter after the attack. Peter Ducey live in Washington. So, Peter, can you confirm that the police are investigating a connection to ISIS here? We can, Martha, and it's because the attacker was reportedly screaming Allah Akbar while he tried to behead one of the victims. And we're told the Roanoke Police Department immediately called the FBI when details like that started to come in. So now the Bureau's special agent in charge of the Richmond Division is telling us that, quote, the FBI is working with the police department following the incident that occurred on Saturday evening. While I cannot discuss the details of the investigation at this time, I do want to reassure the community that we are working to determine the nature of the incident. The man in custody charged with two counts of aggravated malicious wounding is Wasil Faruqi. He's 20 years old and he's being held right now at the Western Virginia Regional Jail without bond. ABC News is reporting that Faruqi did recently try to sneak into Syria to link up with Islamic State fighters, but Saturday night his trip was to the Pines apartment in Roanoke. That's where he ambushed a man and a woman with a knife. The man was able to fight back enough so that Faruqi fled, and both victims uh, did end up severely injured. 911 callers indicate that the crime scene was very bloody. Martha. It's an awful attack, and you can see why this line of investigation is being picked up. Um, was there any connection, though, that they can find between the attacker and these victims? Did he know them? No. As of right now, authorities are saying that they do not think Faruqi knew the man that he tried to behead or this woman that he stabbed so badly with a knife. Uh, it's interesting that Roanoke PD is saying that the victims may have been chosen randomly, so the concern does become the inspiration, and that's why the feds are so interested in figuring out quickly if the inspiration was the Islamic State. Yeah, Martha. Disturbing. All right, Peter, thank you very much. And meanwhile, Martha, there is brand new evidence of a possible pay-for-play situation between the Clinton Foundation and Hillary Clinton's State Department, directly contradicting what Mrs. Clinton and the Clinton campaign has always told us. You know, we've been reporting this morning on those emails, but there are also newly released phone records adding more fuel to the growing political firestorm just weeks before the election. These new phone records show a senior executive at the Clinton Foundation was in regular contact with Cheryl Mills, Cheryl Mills was Hillary Clinton's chief of staff at the State Department. Well, this has caused Donald Trump now to call for the Justice Department to appoint a special prosecutor. Pay the Clinton Foundation huge sums of money and throw in some big speaking fees for Bill Clinton, and you got to play. You got to do what you wanted to do. This is frustrating. Long before that, you should have seen what they were doing in Arkansas. Same old story, folks.
Uh, Chief Washington Correspondent James Rosas, uh, Rosen now joins us with more. You know, James, we've been talking about the emails in the last hour, but now these are phone messages that seem to add a whole new dimension to the story. That's right, Eric. Good morning. And these are exclusive to Fox News. We're talking about nearly 180 pages of official telephone logs spanning 2010 to 2012 and kept by assistance to the woman who served as chief of staff to Hillary Clinton at the State Department. Cheryl Mills was a longtime confidant of the Clintons, and her office fielded inquiries from a wide cross-section of people seeking the secretary's ear from celebrities like Sean Penn to Democratic Party establishment figures like Vernon Jordan. By an exponential factor, however, the greatest number of messages 148 in all, were left by Laura Graham, then the chief operating officer for the Clinton Foundation. One of Graham's messages referenced our boss without identifying that individual. Elsewhere, Graham referenced former President Clinton, leaving his, using his initials in a message that read, please call, WJC is looking for her, meaning Graham, and she wants to talk to you, meaning Mills, before she talks to him. The State Department said yesterday nothing in Secretary Clinton's ethics agreement with the Obama White House constraining her dealings with the foundation applied to her aides. And I would just add to that that the department's actions uh, under Secretary Clinton uh, were always taken with the intent to uh, advance uh, our foreign policy interests uh, uh, as set forth by this administration and with no other uh, uh, intent in mind than that. The logs were released by the State Department to the conservative advocacy group Citizens United, which has mounted a lengthy legal battle over access to these documents and the Clinton emails, Eric. Yeah, James, and now Republicans, some are, are talking about possible uh, perjury investigation. Yes, that dates back, of course, to testimony about the server from Mrs. Clinton before the House Select Benghazi Committee. Not surprisingly, with respect to these documents, key Republicans, like the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, see the Graham Mills relationship as part of a bigger pattern involving these two entities. Do we really think it's just a coincidence that the Clinton Foundation and their donors uh, just happen to have more interaction with the, the chief of staff to the secretary of state than anybody else? Do you think that's just a coincidence? Clinton campaign spokesman Brian Fallon tweeted yesterday, the Clinton Foundation is a charity that helps people around the world. It's already announced major steps it will take if Hillary Clinton wins the White House. Eric? All right, James. I mean, they always said there was no conflict of interest, but uh, it seems some evidence uh, to the contrary may be piling up. Thank you. Martha? So the State Department also scrambling to explain nearly 15,000 new emails that were uncovered by the FBI, which Hillary Clinton never turned over to the State Department. She said that she confirmed for the court that she had handed over or believed that she had handed over all of the work-related emails uh, that were contained on ClintonEmail.com that were in her custody um, that she believed were potentially uh, federal records. Uh, and she provided all of those, uh, as I said, that were in her possession uh, to the department. Um, the FBI, uh, obviously, in the course of its investigation, seems to have found other documents. Tucker Carlson is editor of The Daily Caller, co-host of Fox & Friends Weekend and a Fox News contributor. Tucker, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Hey, Martha. You know, I, I mean... <laughs> It's very difficult when you have a separate server where you're sort of running your own off-site government entity that is processing stuff for the foundation and for the State Department. I mean, the, the fact that everyone's just supposed to accept that this is fine and that she said she turned it over, but she didn't, and right. there's thousands more of them that they're finding out there, and we're just supposed to laugh it off on Jimmy Kimmel and just pretend like there's no there there, or at least nothing to talk about or look at, um, is quite striking. Well, it's a tragedy. I mean, it, it discredits not simply Hillary Clinton and her presidential campaign, but the U.S. government. I mean, she ran the State Department, and they allowed this, and now you're watching State Department flax have to spin for her. The whole thing is gravely embarrassing to the country. It, it makes our government look incompetent uh, in third world, and for good reason. And by the way, does anybody think that this is the end of it? I mean, 15,000 new emails that nobody knew about last week. What comes next? What's in those? I mean, you see what I'm saying? So this is going to be a story that unfolds for years, and it has all kinds of very set implications. And keep in mind, Hillary Clinton, as of today, is likely to be the next president of the United States. What does that mean? It means it's going to be pretty hard for her to dodge a story if elected, and that's bad for all of us. And I know that you're critical of the press on this, because if the precedent is set that, 
you know, we're not supposed to care about this. And this is not a right. story and that it's all sort of designed to make sure that Hillary Clinton doesn't get elected, um, that people need to do their jobs and look into this story. If that goes by the wayside and she's elected president, well, why would they be careful with, you know, any of this stuff? Because it's it, it, unlikely well, to change. Exactly. In I the mean, future. the press has a meaningful role in keeping the government honest. That's that's the whole reason that we exist. Look, we knew years ago that Huma Abedin, her closest aide, was also working at the Clinton Foundation. People basically ignored it. Look, it, here's the truth, and everyone knows it. Virtually everyone in the press wants Hillary Clinton to get elected. Fine. They sympathize with her. They're on her side ideologically. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't cover her. They're ceasing to cover her campaign because they fear it will help get Donald Trump elected. I don't think there's anything she could do that would warrant coverage. I mean, if she got caught taking bribes from North Korea and passed out cold in the middle of an interview, it would get 300 words in Politico. They're just not going to pay attention to it. So what does this mean if she does get elected? And again, as of today, she's likely to. I'm not voting for her. I'm just telling you that's what the polls say. Mm. If she gets elected, are they just not going to cover the bad parts? Yeah. I mean, th I think the press's the relationship question. with people in power has changed in a way that's ominous. Yeah. Um, it, you know, in terms of this Colin Powell part of the story, she, you yeah. know, attempted to sort of sweep him into her vortex and say, it's the same thing. See, apples and apples. Um, here's right. Carl Rove on that last night. He had an account on an established uh, web hosting company, AOL.com. He used it for inner communications inside the State Department. But it wasn't a private homebrew server stuck in his basement. And between the time that he served as Secretary of State and the time that she came in as Secretary of State, the rules were tightened and, and department officials were told explicitly, do not use private email accounts. Very different. Well, yeah, and poor Colin Powell. This is not a new thing. They've been trying to implicate him in this for the past year. Since this story broke, one of the talking points has been, well, Colin Powell did it too. And he hasn't responded. And Rove makes, uh, of course, the key point, which is he used AOL for part of his communication. She used her own homebrew server for exclusively for her uh, for her public communication, for her work communication. There's really no comparison at all. I don't think he wanted to speak up about this. I don't think he wants to be involved in this presidential race yeah. at all. And yet she forced it. Her aides forced it because this was their first talking point. Well, Powell did it too. Are you attacking him too? Yeah. You, you know, you, you feel sorry for him. He doesn't have anything to do with this at all. Just one more. I'm just curious what you think about the FBI investigation given all this, because that's the thing that keeps coming up to me. I yeah. mean, you know, poor Martha Stewart, you know, lied well, to an exactly. FBI investigator and exactly. he went to jail for it. And Hillary Clinton, you know, they sort of took some notes and there's no accountability for what she said to them in that investigation at all, despite the fact that James Comey wanted to make it very clear. Oh, no, this is an investigation. Oh, it, which is the most striking part of the whole story. And it's, it's gotten undercovered. I live in Washington. I know a lot of people who've gotten in trouble with the FBI and most of them get in trouble because they lie in their conversations with federal agents, right. which, as you noted, is a felony. I've never heard ever of a situation where a subject of an investigation is invited in and there's no being sworn in. There's no yeah. tape recording of the conversation. There's bizarre. literally no transcript it's of it. Bizarre. Is that the rule that I'm going to live by next time yeah. I commit a felony? Am I going <laughs> to, are they going to do that no, no, today? No, no, no. Yours I will be recorded, it. Tucker. I guarantee you. Think? you. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Um, and it's I a big it part is. of the story. We're going to keep it's digging depressing. in. Uh, Tucker, thank you. Always great Thanks, to see Martha. you. Thanks, Martha. Uh, that was a great point. Right. I, I don't understand, you know, how you can speak to the FBI and there's no record, no transcript of what you said. And then when James Comey was asked in open uh, congressional hearing, you know, well, did she lie when she spoke to the FBI? He said, no. Well, how, how do you know if there's no comparison of what she said to what the record yeah, is? Yeah. So we're, we're going to yeah. stay on this I think part we of the story. Ask Martha Stewart how she feels about this. Good you question. Know, I know. She was cooking the other day. Uh, I saw her downstairs, <laughs> so maybe we'll bring her back. All right. Well, meanwhile, you know that Hillary Clinton supporters, well, you know, they say all oh, this talk of favorites or big donors, it's nothing new. Politicians do it all the time. But one columnist is making the argument that Clintons take this to a whole new level. It brands them Clinton Incorporated, saying we've never seen anything of this magnitude ever before. And Donald Trump has now delayed a major immigration speech amid reports that he may be softening his hardline stance on this. So what, which is it? What is it going to be? Will there be a deportation force that he has spoken about in the past? We're going to speak to one of his senior advisors coming up next. We have a lot of bad people that have to get out of this country. We're going to get them out. They go around killing people and hurting people, and they're going to be out of this country so fast your head will spin. He will, want, first of all, remove the illegal immigrants who are criminals, and then second, work 
within the laws that we have on the books now, as well as potentially put new laws in place and new entities in place and to make sure we're enforcing the laws on the books and protect the American worker. American people. How is he going to do that? The, the Border Patrol Union, for example, has endorsed him. Mm -hmm. They're down on some of their numbers by a few hundred. I was down at the Texas border. Right. Is he going to beef up customs? Is he going to beef up immigration? Is he going to have this so-called deportation? Right. For another name, the Donald Trump existing is resources and assets now? Donald Trump is unquestionably the law and order candidate. So he will make sure that resources are absolutely... Absolutely beefed up for all law enforcement in this country, and that absolutely includes border patrols. So that'll be a big part of the initiative. And again, we'll be laying out the specific settings when we're going to talk right away. Quickly, final answer. When do you think, when will he give the speech? He's supposed to have it on Thursday. Listen, it'll be over the next couple of weeks. It's an agile campaign, Eric. Okay. And the bottom line is the American people care about the 15,000 emails that just came out about Hillary Clinton. And we need a special prosecutor to make sure that she is prosecuted impartially and fairly. Barack Obama cannot do that. Loretta Lynch right. cannot as well. All right, Boris. A lot going on today, yes, Boris. Absolutely. From the immigration to the email. Thanks yes, for coming in. Thanks. Martha? So staying on the topic of Donald Trump, he is now seeking support from minority voters, saying that inner cities have been turned into, quote, war zones by Democratic policies. So how will that message go over and will it work for him? And thrill seekers at one amusement park getting a little bit more than they bargained for up there. is headed to Louisiana to tour the devastation there as thousands of survivors clean up from the deadly flooding they've experienced over the past week and a half. We have Fox team coverage for you. Will Carr standing by with a look at the recovery efforts. But we begin with Kevin Cork live in Denham Springs, Louisiana, which is the heart of the worst of the damage, and he is covering the president's visit. So, Kevin, what is on his agenda once he touches down there? We can expect at least three things for sure. Number one, he's going to meet with his team. That includes FEMA and, of course, the Department of Homeland Security. He's certainly going to meet with state and local officials and ask them again what, if any, federal assistance they may need moving forward. And then third, we expect the president to, of course, meet with the people who have been impacted right here on the ground by this devastating storm. And I can tell you uh, clearly, Martha, sometimes the pictures really don't capture the full scope of what we see on TV. And I can tell you, being here now, really changes things. Uh, you can see devastation. And I'm talking about debris fields as far as the eye can see in virtually every direction from where I am standing. That is what will be greeting the president when he makes his way here later today. We've seen water lines over six feet high, the smell of mold and mildew and rot just about everywhere. Reminds me a lot of what we saw after Hurricane Katrina. That's why a lot of people were so critical uh, about the fact that the president didn't get here sooner, in particular when you consider the sort of contrasting images of what's happening here on the ground and the president in a relatively tony area up there at Martha's Vineyard playing golf. Martha? Yeah, we're just looking at live shots of the president. He's at Andrews Air Force Base as he makes his way now onto Air Force One for the trip to Louisiana. He just came over on Marine One from the White House. That's uh, the way he travels. And there he goes onto Air Force One. Wave from President Obama as he heads to Louisiana. And clearly, as you point out, he's been criticized for not coming sooner. And how is the White House responding to that criticism, Kevin? Listen, I, I think they're incredibly sensitive to it, understanding and recognizing uh, what happened post-Katrina uh, back in 2005. And so they've spent the better part of, I would say, a week, really, sort of pushing back against this narrative that the president was somehow uh, an absentee landlord, if you will, when it came to getting down here and defending the rights of the people in Louisiana and being there for them to see him on the ground. Yesterday, White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest rejected comparisons to the post-Katrina response under President Bush. What's different about this situation uh, is that in response to this flood, you've got Democrats and Republicans in Louisiana praising the federal response. And I think that's the, uh, that's the most significant difference. And, of course, the president, as you pointed out, en route to here in Louisiana, as you continue to look at just a snapshot of the devastation, again, that is in every single direction here, Martha, really striking. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what his perspective will be when he gets here on the ground. Of course, we'll bring that to you right here on Fox News. But for now, 
Back to you. All right, Kevin, thank you. So meanwhile, thousands of people trying to cope with the damage that was caused by that heavy flooding. An estimated 60,000 homes have been damaged. At least 40 state highways are closed to traffic still. And there's the very beginning of the cleanup effort. Will Carr is live in Baton Rouge with the latest from there. So, Will, how are things going in Baton Rouge today? Well, Martha, this is definitely going to be a long recovery process, and we want to give you a visual of exactly what President Obama is going to see today. We're driving down a street here in Baton Rouge, and we've seen this street after street. Debris piled in front of homes here. Over the past three days, homeowners have really gutted the inside of their houses. They've taken all of their possessions that were destroyed by these floods, and they've put them out here. Really, walls of their personal possessions are what's left of them. We're told that this could take three months to clear throughout this entire area. 110,000 residents have fired, filed for federal aid, and now many are voicing their frustrations to us about problems they're having with insurance. They tell us they thought they were fully covered for this, finding out that they're not. These are all things that they want President Obama to be aware of. Take a listen. There was a lot, you know, saying that our leaders weren't really doing anything, but, you know, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not obsessed with that right now. I don't, I don't care about that. I want to get my stuff out. I want to get my home back to where it was. I think uh, uh, any big political figure that visits draws attention to the, uh, the situation we're in. So I think it's good for anybody to come here. Hotels are sold out. More than 2,800 people are in shelters. Many are just sleeping in their cars until they can get help from FEMA. Some schools in this area will be closed until September 6th because of problems with mold. While this all happens, residents here continue to talk about the heroes they've encountered, people who are out sandbagging. They were doing the water rescues uh, over the past 10 days. The same people were cooking food at night and distributing it in the morning to the people and the sense of this community that the residents we talk to, they want the country to be fully aware of. Martha. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what every one of them has said, that the community has been incredible and that they have received so much help from each other. And that is something we can all be thankful for. Well, thank you. We'll see you later. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. Well, the Clinton Foundation, you know, it pulled in billions of dollars from big, big wealthy donors around the globe. Do you think they expected anything besides charitable works in exchange for all that dough? And a slugger hits one out of the park. Literally. Just wait until you see where he hit, where that ball landed. You know, it had to happen. He has to park his car in that spot. He has to hit the ball to that spot. It has to be turned around the right way. Hillary Clinton under fire as never before seen emails reveal her State Department gave special access to Clinton Foundation donors. But this apparent quid pro quo may be just part of the Clinton business model. Bill McGurn writing today in the Wall Street Journal this. The Clintons are unique in having an ex-president with a spouse in play, not only as Secretary of State, but possibly as president herself. And if you are a foreign government or a wealthy businessman, a donation to the Clinton Foundation might look like an excellent investment at just about any price. Steve Hayes joins us now, senior writer for the Weekly Standard and a Fox News contributor. Steve, good morning. Good to have good you morning, with Martha. us. Um, you know, I mean, the, the Clinton campaign would like everyone to believe that this has been investigated and it's done and people need to move on. Uh, this editorial this morning by Bill McGurn points to reasons why perhaps that is not a great idea. Yeah, no, there's no question that we shouldn't be moving on. We're, we're seeing new revelations about the interplay between the Clinton Foundation and the State Department on virtually a daily basis now. And again, we're not, this isn't speculation. This isn't something that's coming from Republicans launching accusations without the facts to support them. This is, these are things that we're seeing in black and white in emails between State Department officials, uh, including Hillary Clinton, discussing what would be done for Clinton Foundation donors. I mean, this is a, a huge story. It's a huge problem, and it's the kind of, of story, I think, that would have potentially sunk any other campaign in any normal uh, election year. 
But the argument from the Clinton campaign, Steve, is that the foundation has done a lot of good in the world um, and that nobody was ever given anything with the understanding, uh, you know, no donation was accepted with the understanding that it would parlay anyone in government from another country to get what they wanted from the State Department, that there's no actual evidence of a connection. Well, uh, as to the first argument, it's interesting and maybe nice that the Clinton Foundation has done good work. It's also totally irrelevant to the question at hand. The question at hand is whether uh, favors were exchanged for donations made, whether uh, explicitly or implicitly. And th the irony to me, I was I spent a better part of the morning this morning going back and rereading uh, the transcript of Hillary Clinton's nomination hearing from January of 2009. And then Senator Dick Lugar, Republican from Indiana, said that the major focus of the nomination, of Hillary Clinton's nomination to be Secretary of State, was the potential conflict of interest mm -hmm. between the Clinton Foundation and her service, because foreign governments might think that they could be purchasing uh, entree into the State Department by donating to the Clinton Foundation. And that's precisely what we've seen, and it's what makes this so stunning and so reckless by the Clintons. We knew this was going to be a problem. They knew this was going to be a problem. They had to draft a, a special memorandum of understanding between the Obama administration and the Clinton Foundation in order to avoid even the appearance of impropriety. Well, here you have something that goes well beyond the appearance of impropriety. You have actually in the Clinton Foundation. You know, there was also a lot of concern in the Obama administration about the foundation right. uh, when they decided to offer her the Secretary of State position, and you talk about the confirmation hearing that followed that, but the Obama administration also was concerned that there would be this appearance, at least, and as you uh, contend, evidence that there was um, special treatment given to people if they gave money to the foundation. So that was a concern from the White House as well. Here's one more quote from the McGurn piece this morning. We're asked to believe that it was somehow an accident that so many of the millions former President Bill Clinton raked in from speaking fees would come from companies, countries, or people who had business before a State Department run by his wife. And it beggars belief to think all these dollars were being given out without an expectation that there would be something in return. Yeah, exactly right. And we know from the emails that it wasn't just that these donors sought access to the State Department, but that they got access to the State Department. And again, explicitly, directly, because they had given to the Clinton Foundation. That is discussed in the emails. So there's no question that at least on that level there's a quid pro quo. I think beyond that you have a whole series of additional questions, some of which uh, you discussed with James Rosen earlier this hour. I mean, why was it that head of the Clinton Foundation, James Platt Mills, the chief of staff of the State Department, why was it that Cheryl Mills, as chief of staff of the State Department, traveled to New York to interview potential new leaders for the Clinton Foundation. I mean, remember, Hillary Clinton in July of this year said there was absolutely no connection, those were her words, absolutely no connection between her work at the State Department and what the Clinton Foundation did. We can say definitively that that was a lie, it was untrue, it's not supported by any evidence, in fact, it's contradicted, and I think that's the reason that you have uh, so many people and hopefully so many journalists continuing to look into this. Steve, thank you. Good to see you. Thanks, Martha. Well, for a change of pace, take a look at this. A minor league baseball player hit a grand slam, only to find out later that the baseball smashed his own windshield. Take a look at the play. There's Brandon Thomas, outfielder of the Gateway Grizzlies in southern Illinois, hit that home run right over the fence, sending the ball out of the park and into the parking lot. Well, soon after, went out to the car and his truck, look at that. He shattered his own windshield. You know, it wasn't a little crack like down here, you know. That's pretty, uh, some pretty good damage. So at least, you know, at least I knew I hit it pretty good. Wow. So what are the chances of that? Well, Brandon's team went on to win 17 to six. You know, Brandon was drafted out of Georgia Institute of Technology by the Yankees. So with A-Rod gone, maybe the Yankees really need him. <laughs> So Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton gearing up to go one-on-one. -on -one. This is going to be the most interesting chapter to come in this whole thing. She has decades of experience, and he survived 11 rounds in the Republican primary. Does either have the upper hand on the debate stage? And take a look at this human stampede. What led hundreds of people racing through the streets of one city? Well, 
prime time. You know, got the first bout in the ring in just a month from now. The first debate will be held on September 26th at Hofstra University in New York. And right now, both campaigns are beginning to dig in with debate prep. Mr. Clinton and Mrs. Trump, uh, no, <laughs> Mr. Trump and Mrs. Clinton, both talking about their debate strategy last night. How do you prepare for a debate with Donald Trump? Oh, I'm here to ask for your help. Oh. <laughs> You've got to be prepared for, like, wacky stuff that comes at you. And I, I am drawing on my experience in elementary school. <laughs> are you going to be the guy you were in the Republican? Uh, you know, boom, take no prisoners. Or are you going to be a little bit more measured? Well, I, I don't want to really say that. I'm not sure exactly uh, which way I'm going to go, but I may be the way I was, and I may be a much different person. I can't tell you. <laughs> All right. I, I don't think I'd tell you. You know what? If I knew, I don't think I'd tell you. <laughs> So what will this matchup be like? Alexander Smith is the president of the College Republican National Committee. Jessica Tarloff, a Democratic poster and strategist and senior political analyst for Shone Consulting. Alexander, Jessica, welcome. Man, Hi, oh man. Talk about the rumble in the jungle. <laughs> the thriller in Manila. This is going to be at Hofstra. Uh, Alexander, let's start with Donald Trump. What first does he have to do? Uh, I think that, you know, it would be a huge mistake for Hillary Clinton to underestimate Donald Trump. Don't forget, Hillary Clinton was operating in a rigged system where the debates were around holidays. I remember wrapping Christmas gifts around the Democratic debate. Yeah, Saturday night. Uh, I mean, weekends. they were like buried on Saturday night. <laughs> Bernie Sanders complained about that. Yep. And, uh, you know, she only had one serious opponent. The rest of them were pulling in, in single digits, whereas Donald Trump competed in prime time, uh, much more watched debates than the Democratic debates. Uh, there were more of them. And the candidates that he was competing with uh, were all, you know, atop the polls at some point in the race. So the stakes were a little bit higher on the Republican side. I think that one thing he could do um, to prepare for the debates is watch the 2000 Senate debates uh, between Hillary Clinton and Rick Lazio for the New York Senate race. Uh, that was that year. If you'll remember, Rick Lazio sort of marched over to Hillary Clinton's podium with that pledge and demanded that he uh, that she sign it. And if you'll remember, the reviews were sort of this, uh, you know, this thought that maybe yeah, it was a little bullying. I was up in Buffalo covering that, that, that moment. And when he walked over to give her a piece of paper to try to sign the pledge, I mean, Donald Trump could be much ruder. Are you concerned <laughs> and worried uh, in terms of his uh, tenor attitude that, that, that it could go wrong? You know, I, I think that he he should be himself. Um, I think that what the American people are looking for is that they're, they're looking for something that's unscripted. They're looking for an alternative from Washington. They're tired of the old sort of uh, talking points uh, tested, poll, you know, or focus group tested message that comes from politicians. So I think that these are going to be some of the most watched debates in our, oh, in that's our for history. Sure. Jessica, uh, I mean, what, how so, does, uh, let, me, let me get to Jessica. She's got to get a chance in here. Uh, I mean, yeah. Well, okay. if this is what it's going to be like. It's going to be like bam, 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 Jessica. Yeah, I think it will be. I think Donald Trump definitely needs to watch himself and not come off as rude and certainly as rude as he was in the debates, the GOP debates. You know, I don't think that calling her crooked Hillary to her face is going to be effective at this point because I think that she can stand there. First of all, she's so, shown herself to be very resilient in the face of these kinds of attacks and to just kind of say, all right, let him run his mouth. Um, and I think that she's going to be a hardcore wonk, which is what Hillary Clinton does best. And Donald Trump is lacking in specifics on all of his policies. I mean, he was the illegal immigration candidate yeah, but right he may now. Have he have specifics by uh, September 26th. He's been giving policy speeches. Yeah, give but they're still light on. I mean, even though they can't appraise his new economic plan at this point with the details that have been laid out, it's a problem. This uh, pushing back the immigration speech from Thursday to a, an undisclosed time because they're not sure what's going on. If Donald Trump ran on mass deportation and undoing birthright citizenship, for that matter, and now he has to have a think about it. It. Well, Hillary Clinton's been preparing for this mm -hmm. her entire life, so he really shouldn't take it lightly. And when he jokes with Bill O'Reilly about it, I, I obviously think that it's funny, but he should have a more serious strategy. She's a very serious woman. Well, she was, Alexander, I mean, uh, Mrs. Ch uh, Clinton was joking with Jim Jimmy Kimball, talking about she's but preparing she's so for adorable. Ele elementary school. I mean, that's a, di that's a direct dig at Donald <laughs> Trump, saying that she's thinking back to elementary school, basically calling him a child. Well, and, and, you know, I think that it's one of those things where I think she's misunder, you know, or she's not, she's underestimating where the public is at right now. They're looking for someone to speak simply to them, to speak directly. Um, I think we saw in the Republican debates, uh, there was a lot of substance in those debates. There was a lot of talk of policy. And uh, in the end, that he, you know, he was the one that prevailed. Obviously, this is a general election. It's a different crowd. Um, but at the same time, the independents are, are the ones that are up for grabs. And I think that they're, they're the ones that are especially frustrated with the gridlock that they see in Washington. And Hillary Clinton. Right. is a creature of Washington. Well, we're, we're up against the clock now. You know, it's going to be one of the most amazing moments is 
whatever happens when it's over, all the families go on the stage and they all shake mm -hmm. hands. So you're going to see Ivanka <laughs> and Chelsea, who are friends anyway. Right, they uh, are. Old, Frenemies. Old, old, I think, yeah, frenemy, no, yeah. I think they're actually friends. Melania yeah. and Bill Clinton, that hug is what I'm really focused on <laughs> there. <laughs> okay, I'm not going there. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Take care, right, Martha? Hmm, hadn't thought about that. Hmm. All right, let's go to Jenna Lee and find out what's coming up on Happening Now this morning. Hi, Jenna. I haven't thought about that either, but now we all are. Mm. All right, we've heard that. All right, some big developments today in the race for the White House as Hillary Clinton comes under fire, new fire over her private email server and those other emails that are out. Also, some new questions about the Clinton Foundation and its dealing with the State Department. We'll ask the question, does it matter? Also, new questions about Donald Trump and changes to his schedule this week. We'll talk to the Trump campaign coming up top of the hour. Sounds good. Look forward to it. Thank you, Jenna. So missing for almost two years, a NASA satellite lost in space finally phones home. Hello. We found you. 